Welcome to ELT in Chile, a podcast about teaching English in Chile and also teaching online. I'm Daniel Gwim. And I'm Cosulis Poblet, and this is a video episode. So if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can watch it on our website or also on our YouTube channel. On today's episode, we have invited Tom Kittle to talk to us about his experiences related to English language teaching. Yes. So we actually both met Tom back in 2017 when he gave a two-day workshop about changes to the Common European Framework here in Santiago. In case you haven't heard of him, Tom Kittle is a director at Norwich Institute for Language Education, also known as Nile. He has worked there since 2011 after moving back to the UK from Chile, where he was the head of academic research and educational technology at the Chilean British University. He has previously worked in Portugal, the UK, Australia, and Thailand in language teaching, teacher training, and language assessment. He has a master's degree in language testing from Lancaster University and the Cambridge Delta, and his role at Nile involves strategic and organizational management and training and consultancy in a range of areas, including testing and assessment, learning technologies, materials development, and language teaching methodology. Tom is also chair of the Equals Board of Trustees, treasurer and a founding member of Aquaduto, the Association for Quality Education and Training Online, and webmaster for the Testing, Evaluation, and Assessment Special Interest Group of IATEFL. He has published in Applied Linguistics, Language Assessment Quarterly, System, and in 2019, two chapters in Routledge Handbooks of Language Teacher Education. Tom is also a plenary speaker at IATEFL 2021. So welcome to the podcast, Tom. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. We're excited to talk to you. And also, I can see that you're wearing a special jersey. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, my, my connections to Chile run deep, and I thought I'd uh, dress up for the occasion. Um, so this is the uh, the, the number 11 uh, Chile jersey from the 1990s, uh, the, the era of Salas and Zamorano. So you're wearing a Marcelo Salas jersey, right? Absolutely. Very good. So we have many questions for you, Tom. So to start out, how did you get started teaching? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, actually, it's quite interesting. My uh, my mum and dad ran a, a traveling theatre company. So actually, from the age of 11, I was um, teaching circus skills uh, in my summer holidays uh, around Europe, uh, in the UK, in Belgium, Luxembourg, France, the Netherlands. So that was my first introduction into teaching. But um Language teaching started later after university, um, and I've been very interested in languages. Uh, although my degree was in Renaissance history, I, I wanted to, to travel and teach, and, and so I did the um, the easiest route into that kind of peripatetic language teaching, which was a, a CELTA program, um, and never looked back, really. Uh, there's a, a nice expression from, from Hugh Della where he says uh, he fell into a me-shaped hole when he discovered English language <laughs> teaching, and that was very much the case for, for me. Um, it's certainly been a, a passion ever since uh, my first day on that first course. Uh -huh, very good, very good. Yeah, I mean, we all Look have let's that. say, like, different experiences when it comes to, let's say, teaching. You know, like for me, it was like getting in contact with a teacher who was who lived in the U.S. and I was like 15 years old, so it's like very young as well. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think roots into it are very varied, but I think if, if it's your passion and vocation, then it, it's really something that grabs you when you're there and, and you realize how you can help and you realize that it suits your your way of relating to people. Um, very much for me, something that I, I was excited to discover that I could uh, work with and uh, travel as well. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Very good. Daniel, I think you have a question that. for Tom. Excellent. Yeah. So one thing that I was wondering, because uh, I think so much has changed over the years, what was your experience like learning to teach when you were in that CELTA course? Yeah, um, it seems like a long time. Well, it was a long time ago now. This is back in 1997. And um, I remember very clearly that that first experience of, of experiential learning where you're you're taught something in the morning and then you go and try it out with a, a class of uh, teaching practice students in the afternoon and, and my first experience was terrible um, I had a, a a get to know you task to do it was the first one of our group of trainees to stand up and my um, my task was to say my name's Tom and I like something beginning with T and uh, so I did that and I turned to the person on my right, the, the student, and said, and you? And he said, my name's and then went blank. I had no idea what the first letter of his name was. I didn't know what to do. It was like a bucket of cold water over me. And uh, 
I thought, all right, this is sink or swim time. So I turned to the person on my left and, and fortunately it was a much more um, recognisable name. <laughs> Well, let's say it's a very fun experience, you know, like, okay, because we expect things to go, let's say, one way. Sometimes, like, we're prepared to go, let's say, with things like go, uh, let's say, uh, to function very easily, but then we come across obstacles and then we have, oh, we have to improvise a lot, right? Yeah, I think part of being a teacher is, is yeah. being able to think on your feet, you know. Uh, it's, a, it's a commonly... Um, held view that we teach uh, the students not the plan and I think if you're you're expecting the plan to be the way it actually happens in the classroom you have a, a constant uh, awakening of uh, yes <laughs> what do I do now <laughs> a day-to-day -day awakening right <laughs> like okay so this is like uh, what, the, what the program says but then how to deal with this, this is something that's very interesting yeah and Tom well, besides, you know, like the, your connection uh, that you're wearing a jersey, a very important jersey, because that's something that Chile was wearing in the World Cup in France, 1998. So besides that connection, what's your connection to to uh, to our country, Chile, to my country, Chile? Yeah, well, I mean, I love Chile. I, I didn't know much about it before I, uh, I accepted a, a job there, which was... Um, back in uh, 2006 and I, I arrived in the country with a, a nine month contract and um, it was really you know, a great kind of voyage of discovery, learning about the culture, learning about the people, learning about the, the geography, uh, particularly enjoying some of the, the delights of um, Chilean <laughs> agriculture. Um, <laughs> and five years later, I was still there. Um, my first son was uh, born there and um, I, I fell in love with the country and, and really had it not been for a combination of circumstances, I think I'd still be there now. Um, wow. It's yeah, very strong connections for me. I've brought my family back since. I have lots of friends uh, still there. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate enough that in my role at Nile, I, I still get to work with Chilean teachers on various projects. So we've just finished a, a project with um, uh, British Council Chile and Ministry of Education there working on um, uh, Chilean vocational teachers and, and CLIL related programs for them. So I'm uh, still able to keep those professional contacts as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Daniel has been here for a long That's time, wonderful. right? You've been here for a long yeah, time, Daniel. I've been, yeah, let's see. I've been here since February 2010. So I got here just in time for the earthquake, but you've been there longer. So... <laughs> oh, I remember the earthquake well. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. That was my... my I think we uh, all remember... Yeah. One of my first uh, experiences, actually, I'd probably been in Chile for about a month, was uh, somebody coming around to, to fit um, cable TV in the apartment I was renting. And there was a, a mild tremor and the, um, the food I was eating uh, started rolling across the plate. And uh, I looked at him totally terrified and he was like, that's normal, that's normal. You wait for the proper ones. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And when the proper one came, it certainly w was something quite exceptional. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Look at that. Daniel. Yeah. So uh, one thing that I was wondering, so now how did you get started with things with Nile? Um, yeah. Another kind of long story, but I'll keep it short. I was uh, working for um, uh, Instituto Chileno Britannico, Universidad Chileno Britannica. That was uh, my day-to-day -day job. But I also was very much into kind of giving back in any way I could voluntarily. And so I was um, volunteering for the IATFL Chile uh, committee and we were looking to put on an international conference. And um, I asked a, a contact, can you recommend anybody um, who could be a speaker for us at the conference? And uh, he recommended someone. I contacted her and uh, she said, I'd be delighted to. Why don't you write to this guy at uh, Nile? who was the founding director of Nile and now president um, of Nile, Dave Allen, and see if he'll sponsor me. So I wrote to him and said, this is me, I'm in Chile, I'd like to, to bring the speaker over to talk at our uh, ITF or Chile conference. And he said, yeah, okay, we'll sponsor her, but tell me a bit more about yourself. And conversations continued. We both had uh, strong interest in language assessment. We were both working um, in, in similar areas. And um, the conversation developed, and at that time, uh, it was clear that it was going to be advantageous for me to move back to the UK for family, uh, personal reasons. And it, he offered me a, a job at Nile. And I'd never been to Norwich before this either. So it was another voyage of discovery <laughs> coming back to my own oh, country. Wow. Um, and, and yeah, I've been at Nile ever since. That was back in 2011. And I became director of Nile in 2016. Um, and yeah, it's been a fascinating uh, and very rewarding uh, 
time because it, it's meant I can still travel and I can still work with teachers from, from around the world. And that's you know, one of the best things about my job. Uh -huh. and, and, no, no, and, I get, and I guess no earthquakes, right, in Norwich? No, no, not, not what you'd call earthquakes, <laughs> that's for sure. No, no. Uh, other, um, other kind of, uh, uh, what can I say? Um, challenges. Other challenges, other challenges to deal with. Um, yeah, particularly uh, politically in the, in the last, well, since uh, the, the Brexit vote has been very mm -hmm. challenging for us to deal with here um, on a personal level. Um, and also, you know, sharing with, with you and the rest of the world the last uh, 14, 15 months um, have been huge challenges, but um, more uh, out of our control in the same way an earthquake is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's say, yeah, you bring, up, uh, you bring up a very good point, Tom. So talking about challenges, what challenges have you faced with teaching? And let's say also with, with, with Nile, you know, during this, uh, this pandemic, or like you said, a year and a half already <laughs> of this, let's yeah. say, uh, bad situation. I mean, I guess we, we've all been kind of going day to day, week to week, month to month. If you told me 15 months ago, the extent of what we were all about mm -hmm. to, to enter into and, and how long it would be before there was any sign of, of light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I'm not sure that we would have had the, the will or the support to continue at, at Nile. Um, in a way, we, we were quite lucky because uh, we got into online teacher education um, and online learning uh, quite significantly in, in 2014. So we'd had quite a lot of experience in setting up our platforms, developing our approach, We founded Aquaduto in, in 2016, which is an association for quality assurance in online uh, teacher education. But nobody was prepared for the, the, the emergency response that was needed. And so mm. our, our first thoughts were, okay, how can, we, um, how can we deal realistically with the fact that we're not going to be able to welcome teachers to, to Norwich, to the UK? Uh, and then we thought, well, what can we do for the, the educational community? And so within the first couple of months, we put together a, a course, a free course called Take Your Teaching Online, which basically gave our, uh, our experiences, our understanding, our kind of best practices um, as they were. Or, or, and that was made available. And there were uh, thousands of, of teachers from around the world who, who took that course for free. And, and so we felt we were supporting as well as, you know, trying to manage our own personal situations here. Um, and, you know, I think that there's been um, some positives from that exposure to online learning. Uh, the genie's out of the bottle. Uh, one of our battles, you know, in the early years of, of trying to raise awareness of the, the possibilities in online learning was that people hadn't really experienced it or hadn't experienced it in the way that we were doing it. And the blend between synchronous live sessions and asynchronous platforms to support mm -hmm. that. Um, and now everybody's kind of been thrown into that. And so there are some things that I hope we, we don't give up when uh, and hopefully uh, soon we return to face-to-face to -face possibilities uh, around the world, that there are some advantages to online learning. Um, but there are some things that, you know, obviously we can't replicate, uh, we can't do as well, and we don't have the, the, the physical, emotional, um, mentoring support side that we have in the face-to-face -face classroom. Um, so a, rock, a rocky road for, for everybody, but I think we were quite fortunate in, in that we were well prepared for the, the online delivery side, at least. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, it sounds like your preparation, you know, with having started online teaching in 2014, probably set you up pretty well to handle this compared to other places. Um, that still has to be so difficult, though, particularly for teachers that wanted to go to the UK and have that in-person experience. I feel like we can do a lot with teaching online. We can replicate things. But that in-person experience, getting to go out, you know, explore, you know, go to coffee shops, interact with people, I imagine that's not the same. No, it's, and it, it's a, a real challenge because, um, you, you know, everybody's after the emergency response phase, everybody's trying to be innovative and creative and think, well, what can we do with, with the resources we have, with the spaces we have? Um, and so we've been innovating like that. We've, we've repurposed our, our host families to be kind of live, interactive, online uh, interviewees for our students so they can get authentic English in that way. We've had live um, streamed tour guides with people walking around Cambridge and Norwich with uh, the streaming the, the guided tour um, on screen. 
uh, and asking and answering questions about things. But as you say, it, it's not the same. And we're, yeah. we're doing the best we can in a, a replication of experience that's essentially a very, very uh, tangible experience and, and one that's... Um, very valued for, for many people and particularly teachers, particularly English teachers, you know, getting that mm. cultural and linguistic immersion um, from, from being in the country is, is a real challenge. I think the other side of that, um, for, for those of us who work in that kind of study travel industry in, in English speaking context, you know, for, for the, the smaller language schools in the UK, their unique selling point is their location. You know, once you get into that online world, then everybody's your competitor. Everybody's offering things. Some people are offering them massively cheaper th than you are. And so trying to trying to rediscover what your USP is as a, an independent language school is, is a real challenge. I think that's been one of the hardest yeah. things um, for people to, to adjust to. Very different, obviously, in the state system where, where it's been about supporting teachers and, and helping them to, to really um, cope with the move to online and then look at what they can do well and hopefully what they can do better in some situations but um we know that's that's not been a, a smooth journey for everybody and it's uh, it's met with a lot of resistance from from students teachers and and yeah. uh, managers alike definitely definitely and i think um you, you brought up a good point of trying to give people the best experience possible yeah. with having the host families live streaming tours. <laughs> While it isn't the same, I imagine that people are appreciative of that. Um, I attended uh, so a conference online that was virtual, which in the past was in person in Canada. And it obviously wasn't the same, but they really did a lot of work setting up, you know, like virtual tables using Slack you know, um, and things like that, that really, you could tell they put a lot of thought and work into it. And I think that the other participants and I, we really appreciated that. Yeah, so. I totally agree. It's not, <clears throat> we're, we're not unique as a uh, an educational um, sector in, in trying to be innovative and trying to be creative with this, but uh, you see it all across sectors. But I think particularly teachers and, and teacher education providers and, and, you know, these organizations that put on conferences they've been really creative and they've tried really to bring in some of those aspects it's not just the academic presentations which we know we can do live through a platform like this how do you get that wrap around networking how do you still show you've got value for your sponsors who you need to put on your event you know mm -hmm. th those kinds of things are, are really outside the box creative thinking and i've seen some some great attempts to do that although i know that everybody i've spoken to is saying won't it be great when we can meet face to face again? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think that's like I think the, we're all uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, the, the, the final thought, like most people say, like Daniel mentioned, you know, uh, for example, here in Chile at universities, like everybody's like, bro, when are we going to see each other to have some coffee together just to talk about other stuff? You know, we're also, let's say, uh, the conferences like going abroad, you know, or like traveling because you get to have lunch with your colleagues there, you get to meet people and then you get to mm -hmm. just talk and share experiences. And I think that that's something that, yeah, we'll have to, it's going to be a challenge as well. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, the, the, <clears throat> there's a lot of talk, um, not just in, in our sector again, but about whether flexible working is yeah. here to stay, whether working yeah. from home is mm. here to stay. And, and I, I think people are, are missing one crucial part of that, which is it's not so much what happens at your desk, it's what's happening around your desk yeah. and that sharing of information and that overhearing of things that are relevant to you. And that doesn't happen in, in Zoom calls. You know, no. you have you have meetings that are focused, but you don't get that um, supporting atmosphere of what's yeah. going on in your larger organization. You don't get that staff room feeling unless you, you know, really make efforts to, to recreate that. But, you know, there's the time issue as well. Yeah. When when do we switch off when we're working from home? It's, yeah. it's a real challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, let's say in my, in my experience teaching at a university for, let's say, for, for many years now, and the last time I went to university was by at the end of 2019. So imagine like I haven't, you know, visited the university or a classroom for a long time, let's say even before the pandemic because it was a social movement here in Chile. So let's say uh, that, that's very, very difficult to organize and also uh, for, for the university to reimagine itself, you know, to how to reimagine the spaces, you know, and actually what's uh, like, and Tom, like, like, like you said, you know, like having this space or I'm teaching a class and then I just finish the call and then I have to do something else. Then I have to come back to class and then it's like, oh, so, but I'm working, you know, and also living my life in this, in this very re reduced space, you know? Yeah, and and some um, some organisations I think are better at understanding that yeah. and having what, what's really essential is is that awareness of teacher well being and learner yeah. well being and, and knowing that yeah. we need to give support 
there. We can't just push people into these online environments and expect them um, to manage without that support. And yeah. I think it's something that if if there is going to be a blended um, future in education, we really need to be mindful of that and yeah. be mindful of the impact on on teachers' work life balance. For um, you know, as I say, if you're working from home, when are you not working? Yeah. And I think that's one thing, as you say, you know, having those boundaries, having those limits in place, you know, and I think that that's one thing that um, has kind of been put on the individual. I don't know that universities and schools are going to say, OK, you know, supervisors, you know, you cannot contact teachers after 6 p.m. You know, I don't know that that's going to come down in that way. So how do you manage that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I heard a news story today where they were saying they're going to have uh, in a, a big corporate organization Zoom free Fridays, just you know, to, to have at least one day in the week where you're not called into uh, uh -huh. into these interminable you know online meetings. Uh, there's a lovely phrase, um, an impending fear of Zoom. You know, yeah. that idea that you know, there's always just another call, another meeting um, yeah. to, to attend, and that's without your kind of live classes as well. It, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. There are some things we're not going to be uh, sorry to see the back of. <laughs> but it's kind yeah, of funny that you, let's say you mentioned like in the past it was like casual Fridays and it's going to be like Zoom free Friday. <laughs> yeah, that's that. it. When we all get a, a little break and a breather from from this new reality. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I can totally relate to that because I mean, I'm, I love my students. They're all great. You know, um, but I think that I have fewer teaching hours being freelance and most of my classes are one on one. But, you know, like I just lay down, I take a nap or, you know, first, you know, in the morning. And it's like I love my students, but connecting on Zoom, you know, I dread it a little bit, mm. you know, um, and I think it's because of this format, you know, the boxes feeling like, you know, I have to be on and paying so much attention all the time. It really, <laughs> really drains you. Yeah, it's it's an incredibly um Draining is a very good word. It's, it's an exhausting teaching experience, I think, far more so than we, we realized when we kind of said, OK, well, let's shift our um, our face to face timetable into yeah. an online space. We can do the same thing. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in or, or was becoming interested in before the pandemic was teachers awareness of the learning environment, how, how important um, temperature, uh, CO2 levels, lighting, uh, all these things are in inside a physical classroom. Um, but that is replicated online as well. Although we're not directly responsible or in control of our learners' learning environments, their ability to focus on a screen, to focus on the lesson, um, to make sure they're hydrated, to make sure they're taking you know, eye breaks from the screen, to make yeah. sure they're taking physical posture uh, breaks, you know, these things are really important and, and they're not being uh, addressed at all. You know, it's very much teachers get on with it, you know, uh, and you know, teachers have been incredibly resilient and, and adaptable to that. But if there's going to be a part of this in the future, it's something we have to we have to really take seriously. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Excellent. So um, I have a question which is a little more specific to uh, Chile. And so here they seem to want a level of C1 in order for someone to graduate as an English teacher. So what are your thoughts about that? Do you feel like it's necessary to reach a C1 level in order to be an effective English teacher? Yes, it's a great question. And um, look, there, there's so many parts to it. I think there's, there's a level of um, language awareness, which I think is really important as part of a, a teacher's professional competence, uh, which probably does only come from those higher levels when you can really understand what, what grading your language means and what scaffolding support for students language output means and and understanding that um greater level of language competence doesn't mean um you speak in more advanced sentences uh, and you're you know the level of complexity gets higher the, the better you are actually when we get to a certain point language development language proficiency is all about um accommodation and adapting and simplifying your language and having lots of different resources to to adapt that to the the, the level of the people you're speaking to. So there is that side of it. Uh, there's also a sense that we do want teachers to, to engage in the professional discourse community and, and, and uh, read the professional articles and participate in, in professional development activities and attend the, the vast number of webinars they're on. And there's a, a certain level of linguistic um, ability needed to, to get the most out of that. But then there's the other side and the reality that most of the time we're in the classroom, we're not going to be needing 
to display or, or to demonstrate or to teach at a C1 level. Um, you know, for, for many teachers in our systems in Chile or around the world, you know, if we're working with A1, A2 students, then we're going to be grading our language and, and our own output is going to be of a similar level, B1, you know, we want to provide that comprehensible input that's just above their, their language level. And so we're not going to be using C1 um, structures, complexity, uh, richness of vocabulary in our daily lives. Um, so, you know, those are the two sides of the argument to me. I think when we're preparing, preparing new English teachers, we don't actually know what their context of teaching will be in the future. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have some level that gives a, uh, a level of confidence in the employers that these people can be uh, deployed in different levels of language ability um, uh, in classes of different levels. But I think for people who are kind of moving into English teaching from within the profession, a reality check on, on well, what's the level needed to teach that particular class. And it's certainly not C1 in every case. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I get that's a bit of a, an evasive answer rather than uh, a yes or no. But I think <laughs> yeah. you know, those are the two sides to the argument for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that, that makes sense. I mean, I, I see that. And there's something that we, we've discussed with uh, with Daniel in the past, you know, like it depends on the context, because sometimes like like uh, like you said, if you're preparing people to, for example, take an international, international exam, sure, they need like a really high level of English, you know, but also if you're t teaching, let's say, um, a class in, I don't know, primary level or primary school level, you know, like you say, you're going to be teaching A1 or probably, let's say, zero beginners or I don't know, even at university, B2, B2 plus, but C1 is very difficult, let's say, to to reach. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, the, the problem, let's say, starts when this this becomes, let's say, sort of requirement, let's say to pass a test. That's when, you know, when this is something that in a way that I do not like so much, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that um, the reality is that these tests that teachers are being judged against, they're for the most part, I, I, I don't want to say uh, a generalization that's not true, yeah. but for the most part, these are general language proficiency exams. Mm. There aren't um, English for teachers proficiency yeah. exams. And that's mm. one of the things we're really working at now. What, what is uh, a syllabus for the, the language that teachers actually need? How do we yeah. talk about language in the classroom? How do we talk about classroom methodology? How do we talk about classroom management? Uh, and that's a very, um, it's a very specific domain of language use. I don't need to be able to describe the life of a dung beetle. I don't need to be able to, you know, talk <laughs> about um, the, the political system in my country, which might be questions thrown at me in a C1 level exam. Yeah. Um, and so actually, it's probably not not the greatest fit to use a general proficiency exam to measure the, um, the suitability of teachers language to perform their job. And that's what we should be doing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so, you know, as we're talking about this, this makes me think of something. Um, I don't know if this would be possible in Chile. And, you know, obviously this is just me speculating. But would it be possible for students to, after they've taken a certain number of English courses or one thing or another, at one point declare that they're planning on on teaching secondary university more advanced learners, maybe like B1 and up, or if they're planning on teaching primary, that there are maybe like two separate tracks and then that each track might have different requirements? Because I imagine a B2 level would be plenty high enough if someone is going to be teaching elementary school? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are already tracks in the system. Um, I think having a blanket uh, language proficiency level that doesn't take into account those different tracks is is crazy. You know, we, we, need, we need to make sure that everything within that track is is best fit for context uh, and best fit for purpose. And, and so um, there may be much more better spent time in, in kind of primary and pre-primary teacher education, focusing on uh, whole child learning, focusing on the, the importance yeah. of um, awareness of learning differences uh, mm -hmm. than on, you know, setting a, a, a linguistic proficiency barrier, which is going to deter people or make them feel like they're not a good teacher because they haven't passed this general proficiency test. I think yeah. you know, <clears throat> there's also the extent to which in any teacher education context, whether it's a you know a four week CELTA course or a four year um, uh, degree program, it's just the start. You know, it's it's the start of a professional development journey, and we expect to get better. And and that expectation can be of language to get better as well. Absolutely. You know, I don't think we need to put barriers in the way of generating good teachers because that's essentially what we need from a teacher education program is to produce a, a good teacher. 
Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, also, let's say this teaching journey. I mean, we all we're probably all learning, let's say every day, you know, this is like experience. That's why we have experiences, let's say, in classrooms and, and things like that. And let's say, Tom, uh, talking about that, you mentioned a few things that let's say that have haven't been considered, let's say, in terms of the future of English language teaching, for example, you know, like a, a good posture, you know, like maybe taking, you know, uh, I don't know, breaks from Zoom and things like that. So how do you think, what do you think is going to happen with the future of English language teaching after the pandemic? Do you think we're going to go back just to face-to-face -to -face lessons or, or let's say uh, online teaching is here to stay? Yeah, it's the crystal ball moment, isn't it? Um... <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think who, whoever tells you they know what the future is going to be in this no. sector is, is going to be wrong. So take everything with a pinch of salt. I think it's going to be very different in different contexts. I think that um, in, in state education, um, there's going to be that requirement to have uh, people back in classrooms. And, you know, there's that kind of social dimension to that. And, and that's absolutely imperative. I can see it in my own children, what they missed out on in the in the home learning. Uh, you know, my, I realized very quickly that I was an absolutely appalling primary maths teacher. But, you know, <laughs> apart from that, the whole social dimension of, of their learning um, was was missing. And uh, many will have suffered because of that. Um, added to that, the the need for resourcing of, of home and online learning. You know, it's, it's not we're not yet in a situation we can count that as a uh, <clears throat> an attribute that we can expect a family to provide. If you've got three kids, four kids, it's very unlikely you're going to have either the, the bandwidth or the devices to, to have people connected at the same time. <clears throat> so I think state education needs to take that into account. Hopefully there are some things that we can draw out of that and hopefully that will allow some, <clears throat> excuse me, increased uh, integration of technology within the, uh, the bricks and mortar setting of, of classrooms. Um, but I think we need to, to really remember what it is about that collaborative face-to-face uh, -face learning, which, which makes education powerful and uh, meaningful for students. And it's not just what happens in the teacher-student interaction. Um, however, I think in the private sector, um, there's been an awful lot of uh, investment in what people think the future might be. You know, there's, there's a lot of investment in virtual reality technology, uh, aiming to be the future of, of language education. There's there's going to be an awful lot of uh, belief that hybrid learning is going to allow new business opportunities for people to you know, uh, gain um, more students by being more flexible, by having this dual modality, um, the, the, <clears throat> the attraction of blended learning where you can do things before you come to class, the whole flip learning approach where, you know, we actually move some of that time wasted in a, in a classroom um, on instructional stuff and, and save the classroom time for the, the practice and the, the feedback and the support and the co-constructed learning. <clears throat> I think all of those things will, will probably play uh, an important part in, in how this landscape develops. Um, you know, I think it might well be uh, a, a fracturing of what the offer are and, and, and the, you know, the power of the consumer. Traditionally, I think the, um, <clears throat> the model has been quite similar. You know, you go to Chile, you go to Italy, you go to um, the UK, you're going to see a, a fairly similar offering from um, the, the private language education provider. You know, you're going to see a course with a set number of hours and, and the use of a course book and, and the trained teacher who's in that classroom. And, you know, that's that's been the model, but that's possibly going to be, be, um, <clears throat> be splintered a bit by people having realized that there's there's more uh, choice in their hands and they can choose different options at different times to suit mm. them. And, and maybe, yeah, their situation this year is that they do want a face-to-face -face class, but maybe next year they're going to take more remote learning opportunities. And um, what we need to do is to try and have some kind of understanding of what best practice is and some kind of quality assurance within that so that people don't get turned off by really Poor, um, poor offerings and, and low quality and think that well that means that that whole mode of, of education doesn't work uh, and I think mm -hmm. that's what we have to work out as an educational community and and for me teachers need to be empowered to, to support those decisions and to, to drive them rather than kind of being on the receiving end of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, let's say in, in my experience and also there's something that we've talked about uh, with Daniel on uh, let's say our previous episodes, 
last year, of course, it was an emergency situation, right? Everybody was like getting used to this and, you know, and everybody feels like also myself and my students feel that things in a way, this is like things have become a little bit more normal that we're more used to, uh, let's say, uh, the online lessons. So that's why there, there are a few things. Let's say some people do miss going back to class you know, face-to-face -face classes, but some people would like to stay with some courses at least online because they see some advantages as well. So there is not everything, let's say. So it's going to be like a combination. I think this year is going to be a year that we're going to be working things out. You know, it's like, okay, well, this belongs here. Maybe this mm -hmm. can stay online. Maybe this is good here or things like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I categorize it in three phases, really. I think at that initial phase, um, February, March, April, May last year, it was real the emergency response phase, yeah. which is what can we do to maintain education provision? And then we got through that initial phase, uh, at different at different levels of, of uh, confidence and competence, but then it was kind of a, a creativity and innovation phase where people think, well, what else can I do with these yeah. options? Look at all these tools, these platforms, uh -huh. what else could I add into my lessons? What could I do asynchronously alongside my live sessions? What could I do within my live sessions, breakout rooms and, yeah. and third party tools that fit in? And then we've moved into a kind of a, a future proofing and a consolidation phase. Well, when we return, and I'm confident that education will re return face to face. Um, what do we want to hang on to? What do we want to keep? What did we do well? What do we do even better than we, we were doing previously? Um, and, and that's going to be the really interesting conversation over the next couple of years. I think what, what we've got to realize within that is that in, um, in normal times, we wouldn't have made these changes so quickly. And what's lacked in that in that speed of uh, of change has been the um, the systematic processing of what works and what doesn't, the sharing of information, and, and the teacher education, the teacher training, the teacher development to support that. You know, it's been very much in many contexts I've I've seen in the last twelve months. It's been, you know, learn on the job, get on with it, do the best you can, um, and, and that's got to change if we want to continue with this online model. We've got to start to feed in the support and the resourcing for the teacher development that, that goes alongside that. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's so much to consider, as you said, and I know that um, in my case as a freelance teacher, um, I've had some people that have been very adamant about wanting in-person classes, particularly with children. And I do think that that is much better for them developmentally, particularly when they're younger. However, I think that that brings a lot of issues, you know, with health and safety and things like that, that I don't know that we have an answer to yet. Um, we're getting there, you know, with people getting vaccinated in Chile, but I think that that's going to be, there's going to be a layer of that also, you know, and also seeing, well, you know, do we need to meet in person for every single class or could we do, you know, in person one week online another week, you know, some type of combination. And as you said, taking the best of what we figured out with online mm -hmm. and figuring yeah. out how we can make it work moving forward. Absolutely. I think that the other really important thing to, to keep in mind in our uh, in our sector of the educational world is that um, language teaching is about teaching language, to you know, mm -hmm. use an old Michael Swan quote. Um, and language is changing. You know, the, the nature of uh, communication has moved online in so many sectors. So English for professional purposes, English for academic purposes, there's going to be a lot more online mediated interaction, a lot more online mediated communication. Uh, and that means the nature of what we teach and the spaces in which we practice it might need to be mm. mediated in online in online modes just to provide that authenticity that we strive for when we're in a face to face setting you know this call us a, a case in part we have slightly different modes of interaction different modes of turn taking different modes of um starting and ending the conversations and what we need to give our students those resources to be able to handle these these online spaces as well mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, and this leads nicely into our next question, which I feel like you've already answered to an extent. But what do you see as the role of technology in language teaching? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think I've been talking about teaching and technology for, for 20 years and made some bold claims that I thought things that were bound to happen that haven't. I really thought that Touchscreen technology was going to be a game changer for assessment, particularly that actually we'd have so many more ways of, of non-linguistic responses to, to test tasks. That would really be a feature of how we could test more validly and um, 
uh, reliably, really. Uh, there were things that we thought were going to really make an impact on the classroom, uh, 3D printers, Google Glasses, you know, these things that, that haven't emerged yet. And there are things that people are claiming to be the next thing, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. Um, I think it remains to be seen whether they'll there'll be the, the demand for those and the um, professional practices to support them. Um, but I think, as I said before, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. People are aware now on the teacher side and also on the, the student side, there are tools that are out there that can help me with my, my learning. And so we have to be open in a certain sense to at least acknowledge that awareness amongst our learners and that there may be tools that can support them. There may be tools that can support our lesson planning, our lesson structure. There may be ways in which we can interact asynchronously that add value to, to the, the learning. Um, but it's such an overwhelming um, <laughs> landscape to be in, isn't it? You know, it's almost daily. You can you can see, you know, the, the 10 best tools for teaching writing <laughs> online, yeah. the, the 25 yeah. best tips for platforms for assessing your students uh, speaking. And it's it's that overwhelming thing that we, it feels like it's all all innovation without consolidation, you know, and we're, we're just like, you're never good enough because there's always something new tomorrow. And um, so I think we really need a period of consolidation. Uh, and some of the tools that have been around for 10 years and are still around and are still being used for teachers, that for me is a good sign that they're doing something useful and they're working. And so I think there will need to be a consolidation despite all of these bold claims of the next big thing. Definitely, definitely. I think one thing, um that that happens with me is that I see it as a positive and a negative. The positive is there are so many resources out there. There are people producing so many things. There are so many webinars to attend, you know, and that's awesome. But the downside is there are so many things. It's like, how do we choose? What do we know? You know, um, what do we know is going to work? What do we experiment with? How do we choose? And when do we stop? You know, when are we satisfied? Because there's so much that's happening. And, and so we, we have to remind ourselves that, you know, the, the, the technology has to be a means to a, to an end. It's not the end in itself. You know, I've yeah. been at presentations when, when teachers have proudly displayed the, the seven tools they've used to teach this particular lesson. And you think, yeah, but the, the actual language focus and the actual amount of language practice the learners had is, is minimal compared to what you would have done if you'd had them with a piece of paper in a classroom. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, we've just got to keep that in the... I was going to say in the back of our minds, but we have to keep that in the foreground, actually, <laughs> and think, yeah, what, what are we here for? You know, we're, we're here to to teach language. We're not here to teach uh, communications technology via the back door. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and also you made a very good point. In my experience, well, I teach at, at a university. So my classes are usually there, are, I don't know, like 20, 25 people. So I usually divided them in, into two groups, let's say to work with, with, with um, smaller groups. Something, you know, that has struck me as interesting is like the way the students interact also with me and they interact with let's say with with each other because they let's say they interrupt each other they're always saying like i'm sorry i'm sorry no you go first no you go first and also let's say the way that we interact online is very different and so like also you mentioned uh turn taking you know that's this is something that's going to be that's going to change and also like the way we interact on platforms because we i have i also have to have students let's say interact there online so it's also i have to be as a mediator let's say acting uh, acting as a mediator a lot you know also in class but also let's say online mm, yeah it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting word as well i think this this idea of mediation is something that's really important now in language education we need to be aware of it there's this huge resource within the the companion volume to the cefr for description mm. of mediation. And my view is that, that teachers are, are great mediators. You know, we, we do know how to simplify language. We do know how to exemplify. We do know how to highlight. This is part of what we do. Um, we do give opportunities for people to speak. We do give feedback where it's appropriate. We do manage difficult situations. And all of yeah. these are, are scales within the, the CEFR yeah. mediation descriptors. Um, but we need to give students those resources as well. Not all of them are gonna be lucky enough to turn out to be language teachers. Um, so, you know, those skills are, are, are crucial in, in, in whether we call it life skills or 21st century skills or the, the modern workplace. Those kind of skills and increasingly using those skills in online settings are, are going to be fundamental for you know, success in, in using language um, in the third and fourth decades of this century. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. So, Tom, we have another question for you. What language education topics are you currently interested in? <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, I've touched on a, a, a few of them. Um, yes. Certainly, some of my activity at the minute is um, based around mediation in the, the CEFR. Um, there's a, a particular tool uh, we've developed, um, a CEFR filtering tool to make sure you, you're aware of the uh, the range of scales that are available to you at different levels and what they really uh, say about student ability. Um, so I'm interested in mediation, certainly, because I think it takes language into a, a new dimension, not purely linguistic uh, competence, but but also kind of um, non-linguistic competences, doing things with your language for, for uh, real world purposes. So that's one area. I'm really interested in teacher assessment literacy, the idea of what teachers need to know about the way assessments work to be able to prepare students for exams, to be able to write their own tests, to be able to think beyond tests and exams as, as measures of a, um, proficiency, to think about where assessment fits into um, their, their own approach and their syllabus, whether that's formative assessment or whether that's learning oriented assessment and repurposing summative assessment for, um, for classroom tasks, all of those things really interest me. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm really interested in the, the learning environments, the physical um, and virtual learning environment. It seems to me that there are some things that um, teachers don't know about, don't know enough about, uh, that really can impede the learning process, the, the, the level of oxygen in the class, the level of light in the class, the temperature in the class, the ambient sound distractions in the class. All of these things are going to do more damage from our lack of awareness than not knowing how to pass a present perfect uh, structure yeah. you know um, and so, so these things I think are, are gradually being surfaced with technology you know that um, the work of uh, Professor Stephen Heppel um, being able to measure the the CO2 levels the light levels the temperature levels in a classroom with a single device I think these things are really interesting for the future of education not just language education um, and obviously online teacher education that's my day-to-day -day job my uh, bread and butter um, and so the ways in which that develops in the future particularly moves towards uh, pre-service qualifications delivered online. If you take a pre-service qualification online, how transferable are those skills to then walking into a classroom as a newly qualified teacher? Um, these things, I think, are all, all fascinating topics and, and uh, worthy of focus and attention and, and research and, and um, research influence practice. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, I think that this is the thing, as you said, we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> so I think doing research, figuring out, um, you know, what people are doing, how we can influence the environment and help, you know, make learning the best condition possible for our students. I think that's really important. So talking about learning. So there are people that are still going through their teacher preparation programs and that are training to be a teachers. So what advice would you give to teachers that are just starting out their careers now? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, it, you know, uh, thinking back to when I was there, it's very much, you know, as you st start your teaching career, as you go into your first classroom, it's your class. It's very easy to be to be head down and to be focused on, you know, get me through this lesson. Um, let's hope I do a good job. You know, it's all about your own classroom. I think it's important to, to remember to, to lift your head up now and again. Uh, take advantage of those more experienced people around you. Use the staff room environment. Use, if you're working remotely, use the, the professional development opportunities that are out there online. Um, so, so, so look around you at what other people are doing and, and get, get advice, get techniques, get tips, get lesson ideas. Um, I would say that, you know, over my 25 years as a teacher, uh, all my best activities are stolen from others. You know, I love peer <laughs> observation. I love seeing how other people work in their classrooms. I love borrowing ideas and trying them out with my classes. I think that's really professional development at its best and, and teacher um, mentoring uh, support should be focused on that. Um, as, as you progress through, then it's time to kind of look beyond beyond your 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 school, your, your particular context and think, you know, what else is there out there? What conferences are there out there? What, um, so what opportunities are there outside my immediate classroom and school environment for me to be part of the, the wider teacher education community, the, the language teaching community, the professional discourse community. And, and obviously uh, one of the silver linings of the pandemic means that so many more of those are available yeah. online. Whereas previously, you know, 
how many conferences could you go to nationally or internationally or regionally you know that that access to professional development has has um, really exploded and, and that's a good thing i think uh -huh, yeah yeah that's true i mean uh, the conferences i mean we can just go probably uh once a year you know to a conference here in chile and if it was abroad maybe if it was sponsored by the university once every two years you know it was very difficult to do that but now yeah. i feel and like, i think yeah sorry sorry no, just, to say. Go yeah the, the other two things i would say would be um don't be too hard on yourself you know <laughs> it's a mm -hmm. it's a developmental journey for all of us you know and uh, and i'm still very much engaged in learning new things and getting better at what i do um and you know that that just you need to feel a little bit of, of the ability to develop each each year uh, each semester am i doing something for my own professional development but the caveat to that is um you can't just develop constantly at some point you need to let that influence your practice your beliefs to let it percolate down to try things out to, to make it work for you and so that uh, all innovation without consolidation comes in here as well. Give yourself time to to process and, and consolidate your beliefs and your understanding and how that fits your practices um, without constantly searching for the next best thing. Yeah, you know, I think that's an excellent point because um, obviously we always want to be better and better teachers. We always want to be improving, but we do have to find that balance between seeking out professional development, but then actually giving ourselves the time to try it out. Yeah. And it's okay to say, I'm not going to have a particular professional development goal for this semester or for this year. Yeah, for me, yeah. it's mm -hmm. fine to say, I'm yeah. just going to get better at the things I do already. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just going to, you know, focus on self evaluation. I'm going to focus on reflecting on my teaching. I'm going to focus on, on what, what I can see happening in my classrooms. I'm not going to try and put something new in there. I'm not going to try a new tool or a new technique. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, get better at my day-to-day -day practice and that's absolutely um, valid and valuable in, in teacher development yeah absolutely and well i mean uh, like you said and also daniel mentioned there are so many tools out there you know so many resources that we can that we can use tom are there any specific resources that you can recommend to teachers or what are your resources that you usually go to when you have to say teach a class or like usually i don't know check yeah well forgive me for uh, a uh, little self-promotion, but I'm going to flag up the, the Nile members area. Um, so our website is um, www.nile-elt, English language teaching.com. Um, and we have a free members area. And in the members area, there's a whole range of activities um, and resources for teachers. There are um, a series of language teaching ideas, cards that you can take and try out in your classroom. If you're a teacher trainer, there are a set of teacher training ideas. Um, there's a, uh, a text analysis tool, there's a, a, a CFR filtering tool, there are lots of Nile <coughs> webinar series, there's lots of articles from the Nile team, uh, there's a really exciting resource coming very soon, um, which uh, is, is video based uh, teaching materials with a, a collaboration with a, a, an excellent um, organization providing these authentic uh, language teaching videos, and that's all going to be free. Um, in the Nile members area. So huge resources for teachers. Do dive in, uh, see what might suit you. Wonderful. They sound like wonderful resources and that's great that they're free. That's one of the things that we really love here on the podcast is, you know, <laughs> uh, making things available for free and, you know, helping teachers see what mm -hmm. is already out there and help them, helping them improve, you know, as teachers, if they don't Absolutely. have the money or the resources to go to conferences and webinars and all those types of things. Absolutely. So on that note, um, I was wondering, are there any courses that you're currently offering or that you're going to offer in the future that can help teachers with their online teaching? Um, yeah, I th well, uh, there's two things, really. Um, our, our approach to teacher education online through our online courses is uh, it's very much an experiential learning um, environment in that a lot of the tools that we use that are embedded within our platform um, it really showcase ways of using those tools with your learners so, so the kind of tools the third-party tools that we embed like uh, our padlets and our voice threads and our google docs and, and our zoom live sessions they they showcase tools that you can take away from the course and use yourself although you're using them to learn a particular focus of teacher education whether that's materials development or testing and assessment or or uh 
content and language integrated learning or becoming a teacher trainer, whole range of courses there, but they really, um, they really underline our approach to, to online teaching and learning. The other thing is that within, uh, within all our courses, you get free access to the uh, <coughs> Take Your Teaching Online Professional Development course, which is the course that we put together showcasing um, online uh, live best practice, uh, asynchronous platforms and best practices, online assessment best practices, and resources for professional development. So those are, that uh, complete Take Your Teaching Online courses is, is available for free when you take one of our other online teacher education courses. Yeah, actually, I took one of those courses last year. I took the testing, assessments, and evaluation course, so it was it was very beneficial. Um, you know, I learned a lot about that, like different concepts, key concepts, and also I had a chance to work with um, classmates from Hong Kong, Russia, and Ukraine, I think. So, I th yeah, that was great. I also had access to the, I think I've been using the CFR filtering tool. It's it's great, you know, when you're planning. So, for me, let's say that's that's been great. And... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, let's say this is going well, this is what we're going to be doing in the future, you know, like maybe let's say not everybody wants to uh, do a master's degree, you know, because not everybody has maybe the resources or time. So maybe a short course like that for me was one month and it was, let's say it was very good. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you need to you need to choose the professional development that fits your your available time your available resources your, your particular focus uh, hopefully there'll be an increased um, engagement from institutions in seeing the value of, of that high quality professional development opportunities uh, we also have a master's program at Nile which is the largest in in language teaching in the UK um, uh, with uh, a very flexible, modular approach you can take up to six years to complete and, and mm. take a module take a break take another module uh, and really make it work for you um but you're right for some people short courses a little burst of professional development that then mm. you take away and, and and work with and feed into your own practices uh, it is the, the right professional development for that them at that time absolutely you know, and that's that's really interesting. I like that flexibility because I was thinking about this. And I mean, they're really great, uh, you know, professional development webinars that are out there that are one hours, two hours. And I think that's great if it's about a very specific topic that you're interested in. But if you go to like one here, one here, one here, one here, you don't really have that continuity. Um, so I think that what you talked about with like a one month course that would really give that in maybe an intense yeah. way, but it sounds like everything is really, really tied together. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what, what ties it together for us and hopefully, uh, Jose Luis will, will agree is the, the tutoring side, you know, yeah. we, we very much believe in, in tutor led, uh, teacher education. So that feedback and that, um, what we call feeding and seeding and harvesting of people from the group's opinions and ideas and suggestions. The tutor bringing that together and giving support and other ideas and, and feedback and references, that really pulls it together to make it um, more than just a passive learning experience. No, it was, mm -hmm. let's say for me, it was a very active experience. Uh, it actually made me get up very early because classes were at like six in the morning for me. Sometimes it was like the other way around from my classmate who was in Hong Kong. So it was like, because, because of the of, of this 12 hour difference. But let's say th those sessions were very, let's say uh, productive for us because we had to discuss a lot and also share what we did here, for example, in my case in Chile, you know, like in terms of education. So that it was very, let's say productive. So I, I really, I really enjoyed it. And I would strongly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I am hoping to take one of those courses in the future. I have had some other professional development opportunities come along that I couldn't pass up, but you know, I will be looking at that in the future. And we do have one last question for you. So okay, I'm last ready but not that. least, as you may have heard, Jose Luis and I have um, some differing opinions about a controversial question, and we would like you to tell us your opinion. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Yeah. Oh, well, this is definitely the toughest question of the, of the podcast <laughs> interview. Um, I used to love it. I have to admit, yeah, ham and pineapple on pizza was my absolute go-to. Um, now, I, I wouldn't touch it, but I know that my kids do love it. So I don't know if there's something about that kind of association of sweetness with with um, food that's really comforting and really effective but then when I took them to Italy last year their most exciting moment was discovering that there was a, a pizza with uh, sausage and chips on it so they're not really the arbiters of, of great uh, food um, 
uh, discernment. Mm. Um, so I have to say, for me, it's a no, but I know that in my household, it's a big yes. Uh, okay, very good. There you go. Well, we did <laughs> not ask you about the whole... sat on the fence there? <laughs> well, we did not ask you about the family, you know, because I feel like the family kind of, <laughs> no, you know, no, when you no, have, no, you know, I the wife and no. the kids, they take priority, but we're talking about your personal opinion. <laughs> no, Daniel, I think you're just directing his answer, and I think that's not fair. <laughs> no, I, I can see this one's going to run and run. <laughs> no, it's okay. So thank that. you very much. So yeah, that's so it maybe for, we'll yeah. just leave it to agreeing to disagree. <laughs> very Absolutely, good. very good. So Tom, I don't know if you have so many words that you would like to say before. Uh, we... Just a big thank you, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, keep on doing what you're doing. Really valuable service to the educational community uh, in Chile and and globally, wow. as it's all online. Thank you, yeah. guys. Very good. So that's it for this episode of VLT in Chile. So we both like to say thank you again to Tom for joining us. We'll put some resources that we mentioned in the show notes, you know. And as always, you can write us with any questions or comments. And also, if you have any questions for Tom at podcast at ELT in Chile dot com. So if you enjoyed this episode as much as we did, please like, subscribe, rate and or review the podcast. We'd also appreciate it if you could tell a friend or colleague. All of those things really help the podcast to grow and they allow us to continue doing what we're doing. So thank you so much for watching or listening. I'm Daniel Gwim. And I'm Jose Espoblete. So stay safe, stay kind, and keep, keep on, on teaching. teaching.